Venice's Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, and Giovanni. Welcome to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thank you, everyone. I'm really excited for you all to uh, to join us today. We have a really amazing guest to talk to us about uh, himself, his life, the Cobb Institution, and um, about us finding some way out of the massive ecological crisis that we are living through, both as Americans as, and as citizens of our Earth. So, John, uh, Dr. John Cobb, welcome to Fortress on a Hill. Thank you. I've appreciated what I've learned about what you're doing so far. I think it's wonderful for veterans to, to care about what's happening. To act, act wisely about it. Yeah, but, but veterans. I, I, I'm I'm a veteran, but I couldn't. But I'm a veteran. I'm I, I fought the war, war World War Two from the foxholes of the Pentagon, and that doesn't make me a combat veteran. <laughs> Oh, it, makes, it makes you a, a, a unique kind of combat veteran. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Certainly, I'm, I'm guessing <clears throat> a lot working in those foxholes at the Pentagon and how, how, the, uh, how the sausage gets made, so to speak. So, Well, my, my job, no, I did my, my job was simply to translate Japanese documents that were captured. So let's, uh, let, let's, uh, let's start with that a little bit, just, just for a minute. So you, you uh, 1943 to 1946 is that correct those are the those were the years yes the years. yes yes um and what what kinds of documents were they were they just kind of ordinary government or military stuff well they were documents that were captured by the u.s forces in especially southeast asia and they originally went through macarthur's headquarters and the pentagon required that he sent half of them to the pentagon for no good reason, except there was a certain competition between the Pentagon and General MacArthur. So I'm sure he very carefully made sure that he didn't send anything to the Pentagon that was worth translating. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I made one, I think I made one contribution to the war effort, and I don't know really what it was, but uh, the the, the, that was an intercepted radio message. Mm -hmm. And so that's really much harder to translate because there's no way of telling where one word begins and the next one ends when you just have the, it's written there in the alphabet, the Japanese alphabet. Sure. Sure. And, uh, so I was given the opportunity to translate that and I succeeded and I got a ribbon. So. Somebody must have thought that was worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. you, you never know, especially in a in a in a warfare sense. You never know what could or could not be valuable. Of course, especially at a at a particular time. Well, I'm sure I'm not the only soldier who made very little contribution to the war effort. But <laughs> well, it's it's uh, uh, there are all kinds of uses of people. Oh, sure. No, it's, uh, it's something uh, like I mentioned before we started in terms of, of the, you know, you're, you, there's a, there's a cleansing process you have to go through with your own mind in that way. And that people, you know, seeing from, from someone's limited personal perspective, you know, that they, they may have done nothing contributing to the war and they may felt they were never near the, near the war in that way. But that doesn't mean that they that they weren't, you know. So let's sure. back on it and and understand understand all of that. So, so we're here today to talk about ecological crisis, uh, the United States and China a bit, and uh, about military connections with with that crisis. Mm -hmm. um, the our Department of Defense is the twelfth biggest polluter on the planet. If the DoD was its own country, and um, in this, it, it's always very clear that the United States government excludes the military. It does from being counted in any of its evaluations of its supposed progress. 
No, that is that is exactly exactly what happens. That the the DoD has exemptions built into the EPA and other environmental regulations. Um, that almost anything that we hear from the news media these days about an examination of our total carbon footprint, if we want to reduce it to just that that phrase, is you know it, it has it, it includes nothing about the the DoD. Um, so there, you know, and, and even if you were, you know, even when we hear in the news about green initiatives from the DOD or other things like that, that it's, it's window dressing. It has absolutely no real bearing on what's happening to our country in terms of environmental, uh, contamination. Um, so, uh, John, talk to me about, about this connection that you want the United States to create with China and, and China to do the same uh, Fill us in a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think uh, we can all agree that there have been international efforts to get countries to make commitments to reducing their carbon footprint. And Glasgow was the last of these, uh, the most recent of these efforts. And um, they're to be commended. I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm attacking them. Sure, sure. But uh, the scientists who count it all up and say, even if every country did what it promised to do, which would be the first time that has happened, um, it's still not enough to prevent very serious changes in climate. All right, so just having frequent meetings of that kind isn't going, might improve a little bit, but that, that there's no solution at the end of that. So what could happen? And it's very improbable, you understand. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about things being easy, but I think we, we need to think about what, what, what could solve our problem. And, um, be, even before the meeting at Glasgow, whereas Biden was em emphasizing in really unnecessary ways, that China is the number one enemy of the United States. Um, he was also asking China to cooperate with respect to climate issues. And, uh, and, uh, the, um, the result of, I mean, I, I wrote a letter and asked for some things and it was remarkable how, how much of it actually happened. By far the most important was that at that conference, uh, there was uh, the agreement to set up a committee between the U.S. and China. And uh, if th th this is the if that is by no means realized, but if this committee were really being asked by the governments of China and the United States to picture for the world what kinds of changes we would need to make to avoid extreme catastrophe. I think that, and if the United States and China were willing to follow their own advice, I think things could still, I think most other countries would fall in line. So that's, that's my desperate hope. And, um, there's no, I, I, it could only happen if the United States decide that preventing the desolation of the planet was more important than eliminating competition to rule the world. And there's no indication that that is even being considered in Washington. So you, you understand I'm still hoping for it. I think that that is, it's the only, uh, what should I say, action I can see what might have an effect in the next two or three years. And if we don't make a difference in, within two or three years, it will become impossible to reach the necessary standards. So. I, uh, my acknowledging that it's a desperate hope doesn't mean I don't hope it and don't try to do anything I can to encourage it. 
the almost the worst thing that could happen to the planet would be war between China and the United States. Without a doubt. And um, that is the direction that Biden is moving. He has just, well, I, I won't get involved in what happened with Russia, and, but in, in the Chinese case, the, the uh, government of China has invested a great deal of its status in the world and its prestige, as well as its money, in saying you must not treat Taiwan as an independent country. You must recognize that this is a temporary situation and that Taiwan is part of China. Now, Biden is taking steps that seem to be saying we are not recognizing that anymore. And he is telling the Taiwanese people that if China invades, the U.S. will support them militarily in a way they have not supported Ukraine. And um, this seems to be encouraging Taiwan to make the kinds of statements and take the kinds of action that uh, the United, that the Chinese have said they will not tolerate. And the, the Chinese government has been asked now that Biden is saying that the United States will fight China to protect Taiwan. Uh, what do the Chinese think? Well, of course, first they had no, had no intention whatsoever of invading Taiwan as, as long as Taiwan were not declaring, taking the kinds of actions that were unacceptable to China. Sure. They, but if the U S persuades Taiwan to take actions that are unacceptable to China, China says they will intervene and they mean militarily. So since Biden is pushing Taiwan in the direction of taking those steps and, and is guaranteeing militarily, and China is saying it will fight rather than allow those things to happen, I would say we are in a dangerous position. And the second thing that makes me particularly frightened about what, what will happen is that the only war the United States could win against China in the South Seas which is a nuclear war. I, I can't imagine not sending enough troops to Taiwan to defeat the Chinese army. And um, you can, we might do a lot of damage with our Navy, but a Navy can't by itself no. do, do that kind of thing. And an Air Force can destroy a lot of stuff, but it can't do it either. And the Chinese are pretty strong in all those departments, but the Chinese have neglected the nuclear side. They, they thought nuclear weapons were off the table, but a year or so ago, they recognized Biden had them on the table. And so they have ordered nuclear weapons, but right now they, the United States might be able to destroy all the cities of China without having any mainland city of the United States destroyed. And that's, I'm afraid, is a great temptation to some people. So the, I'm very much afraid of that. And I think we, we need to all do everything we can to remind ourselves that a nuclear war is absolutely incompatible with saving the world from ecological disaster. I think it's, I don't think that's the only reason it should be, should be off the table, but it's certainly, that is certainly one. So my, my personal knowledge is not about war. Now, I'm no authority on that at all, but, um, but unless we can avoid a war, there really is, is no hope to make progress on the ecological front. So I think the relation between China and the United States is extremely important. I can understand <clears throat> going back, uh, I want to say this goes back to MacArthur's time that, that, uh, Daniel Ellsberg said, uh, recently in the last couple of years that there was a huge nuclear bombing plan 
for China back that far. And that, you know, it was, it was something that had only come out publicly. I, I, I don't know how many years ago, but recently in the last 10 or 20 yeah, years. Yeah. And it, so, it's, it's not off the table. I'm afraid. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's not off the table in the least. And aside from the nuclear aspect, like you mentioned that China has done, uh, quite a good job of designing its military and its defenses to deal with the United States without coming into direct contact, conflict with, with, with the U S which is, I, I think is really, um, it really shows you about their values in that way. No different from the way that Russia is behaving during uh, it in, in most strokes. Uh, during its time in, in Ukraine right now, but you're absolutely right. Nuclear war is, is, is not off the table. It's, it's still seen as, as something very usable, very, um, you know, it may, may, maybe last resort, but really not. Um, and like you said, once that happens there, 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 there is no going back. There is no putting the, putting the lid back on the bottle at that point. But, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, about the living earth movement and how this, this relationship between how you bring China and U S into this relationship through the, through that, through that lens, how, um, how could this improve things to where that, as opposed to being in much more closer chance for direct conflict, that it could diffuse and resolve some of that. Well, to, to make it clear. None of us know how to, how to prevent things from going bad. Sure, sure. It, it, it's it's simply a matter of grabbing any opportunity that comes along, and it was um, begun almost accidentally. I mean, that is, I had not thought of creating another institution. I've created eight or nine institutions, and so that's enough. But. Um, all of them, I mean, almost all of them have a heavy emphasis on environmental matters, but, uh, none of them have, um, focused on, or even sort of opened themselves to dealing with how, how do you deal with governments and get them to behave in ways we would consider sensible. And, uh, some people in NGOs are aware of it, that if, if they get into things like, like that, that they may be violating the NGO limits. Well, uh, I, I, I wrote a letter to Xi and Biden, and I asked Biden to stop using the language of enmity if he wanted Xi to cooperate on anything, but specifically on climate change was, and was move, what the from, move from en enemy to competitor, right? Yes. Yes. Something like. I mean, I, I didn't, wasn't trying to dictate the language with oh, this. Sure, sure, yeah. there, there are plenty of ways of being descriptive that don't apply enmity and certainly military enmity is. So, um, then I also asked she in the same letter, if Biden made any gesture to please take that seriously, because it probably was politically costly to him. And, uh, then I asked them both to please cooperate with each other to give leadership to the world. They could give leadership that nobody else can give to save us for the sake of our children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, and so forth. Okay. Sentimental, but real, Absolutely. real sentiment. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Biden did include in a speech that didn't you that it was possible to use other language rather than that of enmity. He made a public speech and said that. And by, and she, who had about decided he wasn't going to go to any of the U.S. sponsored, uh, the West sponsored, but U.S. is key, of course, conferences, uh, did go to Glasgow and they did announce the creation of a committee. So, uh, some other, some people were excited about the fact that it looked like we might even have had some influence. And, uh, if we could continue having influence, we needed to get a group of people together who could work on that and be, be responsive. So that, that's why we exist. 
and uh, we do not, we are not an NGO. So we're just a bunch of people. And that, from my point of view, gives us the freedom to say what we want, when, when we want, and do what we want, when we want. And, uh, but that doesn't, I mean, we, we, uh, we tried another letter to the new committee, and I think it was received. But of course, they can't do anything that their governments don't want them to do. And I'm afraid the U.S. government. But I mean, I, I really think Biden doesn't want the planet to become a, a, a desert. But uh, he is much more committed to making U.S. the monopolar head of the world. And China is not uh, at this juncture ready to say, oh, we'll will be your lapdog. Therefore, it is its enemy. Uh, I have become almost bitter about the fact that the U.S. has adopted a foreign policy which inherently requires constant war and the destruction of other nations. That's uh, the worst foreign policy any country has ever had. And unless and both the Democrats and Republicans are completely committed, there is no significant political force in this country working to change that. No. And it was all the result of the neocons, and I'm a conspiracy theorist. They, the neocons arranged for three buildings to be destroyed in New York and for the Pentagon to be attacked. They had said in advance that what we need is a new Pearl Harbor. And my closest colleague, David Griffin, he's my theological colleague, and my process philosophy colleague. He spent a decade of his life and I think he was better informed than anyone else in the world. That doesn't mean that he didn't require a lot of other people to dig up the information. Sure, sure. He wasn't doing that kind of research, but, but he published a whole series of books on 9-11. And the evidence is overwhelming. And now there are two to 3,000 licensed architects and engineers who say the official story about 9-11 cannot be true scientifically. <laughs> it's very interesting. The response of the U.S. government of the Department of Commerce, which was specifically involved in the request to change the story so that it could be scientifically true, they said the government is not in, not required to be truthful. No. Truth has become a very low value it, it, in our educational system. We spend much more time teaching people how to persuade other people of whatever we want to persuade them than we do and how do you, how you decide what is true. Uh, I'm, I'm, as you can see, disappointed in my country. The guys and I love doing the podcast. Being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us, but we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with somebody, anyone, who you think might be affected by it. Young people looking to join the military or parents advocating for one, conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name, advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment and the military creates for minorities and inflicts on minorities across the globe, and anyone else you think might affect. He, please share this item with them. Yeah, please share those with them. We get asked often what people can do to help support the podcast. One very powerful way is to help us grow and reach more people is to leave us a review. You can do that on iTunes, which is the best place to leave a review. iTunes does reach the most people these days. The next best place is Facebook. Go to our Fortress on a Hill Facebook page and look for the reviews tab. And finally, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping us for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 or more a month will be mentioned here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help us keep going 
paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out these honorary producers, and they are. A special thanks to our Patreon honorary producers, Fahim Shirazi, James O'Barr, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Caron, Zach H., Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds. Why I Am Anti-War Podcast, Korgoth, Rick Coffee, and the Status Quo Podcast. You are all the engine that helps us power the podcast. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me slash fortress on a hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. There's t-shirts, mugs, phone cases, and a whole lot more. And now, let's get back to the podcast. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify, you name it. Anywhere you listen, we're waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a member at patreon.com. If you're not into doing a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. Yeah, it's it's uh <clears throat> it's something that we deal with a lot. Um, talking in different, uh, topics here on the podcast, the, uh, the refusal to, to look the truth in the face and, and see it for what it really is. The, how many years did it take for us to, to end the war in Afghanistan? Um, what you were just talking about, what ha- what really happened with nine 11 and a full accounting through our government has never, never taken place. Um, and I'm, I'm also these days in terms of nine 11, I, I fall into the category that uh, Scott Horton from AnyWar.com does is that he, that the Americans who died on 9-11 are as much victims of U.S. hegemony as any soldier in any war. It was our policies. It was our, our doing that brought that back home to us. Um, and we, we have to be willing to look those things in the face if we're not. And, and the biggest one, the overwhelming one, the, 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 the mushroom cloud of issues is, you know, is this, is this ecological disaster is, is what's yeah. happening with, with climate change. And, and even when, when, you know, the tiniest little glimpses of people recognizing truth come through that Americans by and large don't care if they know about it, they, it's, it's not a, it's not an issue for them. It's not a day-to-day thing. And they, they, they can't understand how that is already probably in many ways making their lives harder by not, by not even understanding how it comes full circle. I have been impressed by the fact. I thought that maybe, you know, when climate change began to have dramatic effects in the planet, that there would be a real awakening. And, uh, but I've, I've discovered that how people respond to things is pretty much determined by American propaganda Mm -hmm. and the propaganda is not denying that India is suffering and and Pakistan, North India and Pakistan are are suffering immensely. I mean, the heat wave there is almost beyond imagination and it's accompanied by floods because the uh, Himalaya glacier is melting so far. And uh, I think, um, we are told, well, yes, they're having a bad time, but this is nothing to be to be really concerned about. No, nope, not the norm. <clears throat> Whereas the Russian behavior in Ukraine, you need to know about every civilian who was killed, and so it, it's our minds are just so brainwashed. <laughs> And our universities no longer teach people to think. 
they, they teach people how to do scholarship and scientific research, but there's, there's no department of that encourages thinking. And, uh, I think that's one reason that Americans are unable to be critical of the propaganda they receive. PhDs are just as vulnerable as anybody else because they've never been taught to look at the broad picture. Yep. Piles, piles of degrees in education don't, don't always change someone's ability if they weren't taught how to think from, from the jump. And that seems to be really emblematic of America as a whole, mm -hmm. that, that the, that we're, we're given buckets and buckets and buckets of what to think, but we're not ever taught really how to think, how to, how to discern for ourselves and especially how to discern the, the falsehoods from our government. Um, but also there's the, you know, oh, also from our corporations. Yes. I was just going to, going to mention that is that <laughs> the marriage between the government and the corporate state has made it so that it's, it's that much harder that there is, there is no one who is actually, you know, willing to step back and say, okay, this is a problem and we need to rectify it. Doesn't matter who or what's at fault in it. Just let's try to do something about it. Yeah. I think, I think that's the other thing for Americans is that Americans are, are so, um, moral based in their thinking that it's about who's right and who's wrong. And who's right and who's wrong is important at times, but Tom, sometimes there are problems so massive that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. And that's where we are with climate change. It doesn't that, matter. That's right. With both nuclear war and climate change, we just have to figure out how to get through this. Yep. Not, not worry about who did what wrong. There's plenty of guilt to go around. There is, <laughs> but that doesn't. Who is more guilty than who doesn't help us? Well, that, let me say something because what I've worked on for years is the environmental stuff. And I, I'm so frustrated now that we won't be, we're not even giving a chance to get to it. A, a war will make it irrelevant, I'm afraid. Yeah. But, um, we have hoped that we can provide a picture of an alternative to the, to the self-destructive society and civilization that we now have that will actually be happier and more enjoyable, certainly more beautiful. Uh, and that, that would help because when, when you only talk negatively, people are afraid you're going to take everything away from them, but there are ways of building cities. And I was a great admirer of Paolo Soleri, but, uh, I don't know whether you know his, um, arcologies. Hmm. Uh, well, I, that would be of interest, but, um, uh, nobody, everybody was impressed by his, the art. He was a great artist. We, we thought if we could show that a world that was based on small more or less self-sufficient units that people lived near where they worked and shopped and everything else. So you didn't have to spend two hours a day driving a car on a Southern California freeway. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, you, you, children could be much closer to how things were really done in the world instead of. I mean, children really don't understand much about how anything is done because they get just the results in a store. And if, if a small community produces most of its own food, that you, you get your hands in the soil. And, uh, then it's so important that communities not be the final commitment but that they be in community with other communities. And we do have one wonderful example in recent times, the European nations were each one, a kind of community. I mean, being German meant a great deal. Being French meant a great deal. Being Italian meant a great deal. They cared about their countries and of the citizens of the country, which thought of as being brothers and so forth. I don't mean it was perfect in that way, but nevertheless, the nations played a positive role 
but because they were in enmity to each other, fundamentally competitive with each other, the Europeans did a lot of fighting with each other and they dragged the rest of the world in with them. And at the end of World War II, De Gaulle and Adenauer said, enough is enough. Let's have a European community. So that's a what I call a community of communities. And I think that each nation should also be a community of communities. And finally, we get down to the local community, which is a face-to-face -face community. <clears throat> there are relations that you can have, but it, it, that's not an impossible idea. I mean, it's, it's been realized at many places. The, the states in this country prior to the civil war were for many people, the sovereigns, my, my Georgia ancestors thought Georgia was a sovereign state and they were not in favor of <clears throat> seceding, but once the state seceded, their loyalty was to the state. Well, since the Civil War, the U.S. has certainly been a community of communities. No one, th no, I, sh I shouldn't say no, very few people would put the interest of any one state above that of the nation. So, so uh, the idea is not a nonsensical idea or a fant fantasy or just wish for It can be done, but I will put a little bit of the philosophy in here at this point. The, the philosophy that governs our universities and our government and our corporations and, uh, our society to a very, very large extent is a substance philosophy. And, uh, the idea of a substance is almost always a sort of, of course, you know, everything I say needs to be qualified. You, you, you understand that. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, I'll try to suggest, we thought of atoms as the units that made up the world. And the atom was thought of as something physical, material, solid. Sure. Well, if we think of that as being what makes up the world, then also when we think about individual people, an individual person is a kind of an atom. And this is very important in economic theory so that, um, uh, the, the the atom is related to other atoms only externally. That is what is happening to the other atom doesn't matter to this atom unless it is hitting it, striking it, pushing it, pulling it. So those are external relations. And, um, if you think of ourselves as individuals in that sense, there is no such thing as community and you can study economics for 10 years and you will find there is no such thing as community. And if you also think of nations as atoms, then their relationship to each other is com competition. And, uh, there is no higher loyalty than to one's own nation. And if it hadn't been for the formation of the European community, I might say oh, it's not possible, but we know it is possible. And uh, Latin, there are many people in that many countries in Latin America that wanted to create a Latin American community. And Venezuela was leading them. So of course we know what happened to Venezuela. And there were many countries in Africa that wanted to create an African community and Gaddafi was leading them. And we know what happened to Gaddafi, but in, it's not impossible. It's not that the people of the world don't want it. So. The move to putting community above the individual and learning that, uh, an individual human being cannot be much if not in community. If you don't have a family that loves you and cares for you, your chances in life are very limited and the family as a whole, if it doesn't have other families, we need each other and psychologically we know that. But we build our social sciences largely on the notion of substance. Now, process thinking says events are primary, n not substance. And in order to understand quanta, 
you have to think of them as events. And events are dependent upon everything that has ever happened. It, it, they, are, they are made up of relationships. They are constituted by relationships. And the moment of human experience is an event. And it's influenced somewhat by everything that's ever happened to you. But the, you have not been independent of your surroundings. It, it's what your parents thought and felt had an enormous influence on you. And you went to school and had teachers and playmates. So an event is the synthesizing of relationships. And if we think of the world as made up of, of events, of the syntheses of relationships to others, then going it alone as an individual's substance is crazy from the get-go. So there's much more that I could say, but I, I have been deeply committed to changing from this philosophy to sometimes we call it an organic philosophy or an event philosophy. There are many different terms, but it's, it's not easy to get people to think in a different way because our very grammar is based on substance thinking. So much of the experience of being an American is, you know, if you're, if you're someone living in a, in a working class community, especially where there might be a lot more black people or Hispanic people that your government is actively involved in a process to break your community apart, that the, the law enforcement actions and how the city ultimately sees the, the welfare and the needs of those people. And even if you get up to the higher echelons where community can be created in the way it is, it, it, people don't try to look at it that way. They don't understand that we're creating an organism that should be able to respond to other organisms like it. And that's not what American communities by and large are. There may have been some, we may have, you know, we've had them with along our history, but for them to be able to exist without threat and become entangled with others, it, it's just not something that's, that's natural or normal for America or Americans. Um, especially that we live in a, in a culture where so many people are, are back seated, you know, that they're, they're pushed back to second and third class citizens, unable to get jobs, especially unable to get any job that is not detrimental to them as a person, depending on how many hours they work or what they actually do. Um, you know, that, that, that exchange of, of wage for labor has become so polluted that, you know, people, you know, the, the, the huge union pro union kick that the United States is on right now which is wonderful. I'm not saying anything bad about it. Um, that, uh, that just caring about people that, especially people that we, we can't comprehend how they live. It, it's really, it's really seems to be a negative to us. You know, that if we, if we can't understand how someone else thinks, how could we understand how they live? But, but you can, it's, it's, it's very simple. It's, it's not, it's not difficult at all, but we make it more difficult. We make it harder than it, harder than it needs to be. And that's how corporations and the government to a certain extent are able to extract that excess value and just take what they want, take the money and, and go. Um, well, you, you can, you understand why I think metaphysics is the most important study. Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I absolutely do. And, but, but that's something that makes most people laugh. It does. It does. And that's, and that's really sad. <clears throat> well, uh, so, uh, so a, a philosophy like that immediately moves into ecological thinking and supports it and into community thinking and supports it. And we think that if we talk both of human relations and human being, we only become really human persons in and through community. Absolutely. We can't do it as an isolated individual and we, and the nature can only survive if we allow it to organize itself in ecological ways and community and ecology are not identical and that the distinctions need to be thought about. I just mean, all these matters, of course, require a lot of thinking <laughs> when I summarize and talk about results 
uh, I, I know it makes it seem very simple and we, we know it's not, but I think if we, if we could succeed in getting the American people to think, oh, it would be wonderful to live in an ecological civilization instead of just feeling like it's a matter of giving up this and giving up that, there would be a better chance of getting a positive response to the changes that are needed. I hope you understand that I don't think I or we are going to succeed in saving the world, but we're going to do what we can. I think that that's, that's, uh, the most important thing is that, you know, that the, we, we certainly want to, we want to hope for the best and we, we have to be willing to prepare ourselves for the worst, but it's a, it's a, the, the di di dichotomy there can be very frustrating at times. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, you know, we, we hope that things can happen, but it's, it's, you know, when you're, when you're really connected to the reality of it, it can seem rather bleak. You, you combat veterans, I think. Have a, I'm glad you organized because I think you, you have a credibility in some circles that, uh, people like me don't can't have, and that's okay. I mean, we have to find people who explain the hope in many different ways, in many different contexts, in many different circles. And I hope one of the things that we, we wish we could do through the living earth movement is call attention to the fact that lots of people want to keep a living earth. And there are lots of organizations that are making a contribution, but it's hard to speak of a movement now. And without it turning into a movement, the political effect is very small. So that's our dream. That doesn't mean we know how to do it, but we, we are not. We, we call ourselves the living earth movement, but you know, a dozen people sitting around a table is not a move. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> and, uh, so if we can, if we can build connections, once again, we think everything relationship is so important. If we can build relations with people like you and with people like the Sierra club and with people like. And the peace movement, you know, on and on and on. I, th I think the United States is ready for, a, a, a it, 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 it needs leaders that we don't have now, but is ready for a party that is not sold out to the corporations. You just got to find where the party is. It, uh, no, I, I had some hope that Stevenson might make the Democrats that kind of a party again. I mean, the Democrats in the decades after World War II were the party of the labor unions. And, uh, this was very interesting. If you earn say $2 million, you could keep a good deal of the first million, but the second million you pay 95% of it in taxes. I, again, don't trust my details, but you understand what I mean. Yes. It was hard to become a billionaire in those days, but now we don't tax billionaires because they're, I don't know. I think the American people have a certain kind of admiration of those who succeed. And when you are told that there are no values and that's what the academic disciplines teach, that leaves the value of power and wealth. And, uh, if, if, if you are taught, taught in your whole school system, that power and wealth are really the only values, then you will, you're very likely to admire rich and powerful people. And, uh, I'm the Christian, I'm a, I'm a Christian minister of the Methodist church. Uh, I, I'm not bragging about what the church has done. We've shot ourselves in the foot over and over again. But, uh, if, if the church is, uh, going to disappear, then I, I don't mean completely this, but you know what I mean? They, they no longer have any real status in, in the world and the numbers are dwindling so rapidly, but it's something, some institution that cares about values needs to play a significant role in education. 
uh, I don't think that that the de that ju just getting rid of values may will get you rid of some bad values, but uh, that uh, it, it's astonishing to me that people think an educational system that requires us to belittle values is a healthy way for a nation to prepare for the future. It, it's just astonishing. I, I, I can't get my head around. I'd like to express my thanks to Dr. Kopp. We were disconnected before we could say goodbye. I want to thank him for his time and his insight. Hopefully, he can come back again for another discussion. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time.